Hi everyone and a happy preservation week. Welcome to today's webinar, Creating Scrapbooks at Last. My name is Tara and I'm a preservation specialist at NEDCC, which stands for the Northeast Document Conservation Center. We are based in Andover, Massachusetts, but I work from my office in Eugene, Oregon. I look forward to sharing this material with you and there should be time for any questions or ideas that you may want to discuss at the end. Um, today we'll be talking about making scrapbooks, those messy but wonderful bound volumes that people love to compile to store memories and mementos. I will turn off my video now so that we can focus on the content. So here's our agenda for today. I'm going to start with a brief introduction to the history of scrapbooks, then I'll dive a little into their structure, materials, and preservation concerns, with a focus on archival materials and preventive practices. Lastly, I'll talk about handling and storage, and then we'll open everything up for questions at the end. Since scrapbooks are an incredibly varied format, it's helpful to start with some basics to define what we're really talking about, which includes looking at a brief overview of their history and development. Let's start by explaining what we mean by scrapbook. Scrapbook is a flexible term that can refer to any type of book that contains scraps, like scraps of paper, attached to the pages of a doc uh, to document a person, a place, an event, um, anything like that. A scrapbook may be created by one person over a long period of time, or it may pertain to a single event, or it could be assembled by a group of people over time. The materials found in scrapbooks also vary widely and can include multi-page documents, oversized items, and even three-dimensional objects. These materials may be folded or overlap one another. Sometimes there may be annotations and identifying information written on support pages or objects. But in other cases, there are scrapbooks without information regarding their content other than the text included on printed scraps. Scrapbooking itself is done by both men and women. Sometimes they are highly personal in nature, and sometimes they're very focused on recording business or corporate practices. They can be valuable resources for learning about a person, an event, or what life was like at a certain point in history. The contents within scrapbooks are ephemeral. They are items that were not meant to last beyond their first use, such as cards, newspaper clippings, napkins, matchbooks, theater programs, other things of that sort. Yet now we're faced with the challenge of preserving all of these items. The idea of gluing materials in a book to save them is not a new concept. However, pre-made albums or scrapbooks were not commonly available until the 19th century. Until the Industrial Revolution mechanized paper manufacture, paper, and therefore books, was very expensive. It was not uncommon for individuals to repurpose whatever books they had on hand as scrapbooks. For instance, Excuse me, somebody's asking for captioning. For instance, an old business ledger might have newspaper clippings, drawings, um, and other things like that glued in over the old text. The practice of extra illustration was also common for a time. So you might have a book on a certain subject, and you would paste in articles or images on the same topic, even if it had no other relationship to the text. In the 1600s, a type of blank book called a commonplace book was popularized. People use these books as a way of um, collecting speeches, writing, conversation, and so on, similar to a diary, but uh, less personal, since they were often brought out and shared. The authors would paste in their own book plates as well as notes and cards from others. This became a practice that was taught at Oxford and Cambridge for society gentlemen, as well as scholars to document their thinking and reading. Sometimes they were referred to as memory aids or teaching notebooks. 
use of commonplace books continued through the 19th century. Perhaps a subset of scrapbooks are botanical items. Collecting plants in bound volumes has been a popular pastime for hundreds of years, especially in the 19th and 20th century. Both amateur and scientific collectors produced albums of botanical specimens using adhesive, sewing, and pins to hold the plant samples in place. Depending on the purpose, these scrapbooks can vary in size, detail, and structure. Obviously, botanical atom Botanical albums like this have a set of preservation concerns apart from a regular photo album or something. Um, organic samples like leaves and flowers are very prone to fading, drying out, and becoming terribly brittle and fragile. Depending on the species, a lot of plant samples become acidic as they deteriorate and can leave goo and fibrous matter on the pages. Also, the method of attaching plant specimens often involved metal pins or glues that only hasten the, the deterioration of the samples. I also want to point out that mercuric chloride, lead, and arsenic were often applied to natural history specimens to protect them from insects. You may find these in materials as recent as the 1980s, and they pose obvious health concerns. So to be safe, you should always store these items separately from other materials and use materi these materials in an open and well-ventilated space. Wear gloves when handling them and wash your hands afterwards. If anyone wants more information on this, do a, a deeper dive. I included a link to the American Museum of Natural History's residual pesticides page in your resource guide. It has a nice overview. In the 19th century, innovations in printing technologies like the letterpress and lithography allowed commercial printing to increase significantly. Cities and towns started producing daily newspapers and journals full of colorful ads, elaborate lettering and illustrations, and riveting headlines, all perfect for adding to scrapbooks. Printed ephemera like tickets, flyers, advertising cards, and more became widely available. You might literally give it away on the street. And as you can imagine, it wasn't all designed to last forever. However, collecting these items became very popular. Scrapbooking became so popular that by the 1850s, companies started selling commercial books and especially papers designed for just this trend. Mark Twain actually patented, patented a scrapbook in 1873 that came with pages already coated in a sticky goo called mucilage. This was a common gum that was used to affix scraps to the pages. Twain even coined the term scrapbooking. Before that, it was just called scrapping or collecting scraps. Scrapbooking is still popular today, uh, despite the advent of digital photo sharing and websites. People still love making physical albums for special occasions like births and weddings. Thanks to the emergence of big chain craft stores, there's a ready supply of decorative paper, stickers, and lettering to choose from. But these aren't necessarily high quality materials. Unfortunately, a lot of the pre-made albums and decorative scrapbook items are made out of cheap plastic or acidic colored papers, and these materials really won't stand the test of time. There are some scrapbook kits available on the market now that are being marketed as being archival. On the screen, we have an example that is being sold by Gaylord Archival. If you look at the features of the kit, it includes a pigment pen, pages that have passed a PAT test, which is something that we will talk about in the next section, and a pH neutral adhesive. These kits are an acceptable choice if you want something that is ready to use. Um, they can get a little bit pricey, but it is possible to source these individual materials yourself as well. We will discuss what things to look for in materials in a little bit. Um, if anybody has any questions so far, please feel free to add them to the chat. I'm just going to pause for a moment and take a sip of water to give you a moment there.
All right, I don't see any questions, so let's uh, continue. Now that we know a little bit about the history of scrapbooks, let's discuss the structure and materials commonly found within them and the preservation issues associated with each. I see I have a question. Do you ever suggest page separation? That is a good question. We're actually going to talk a little bit about that with um, interleaving and such. So um, hang on, we, we will um, get to that in a little bit. Thanks, Kat. Okay, so binding is what holds the pages within our scrapbooks together. You can find many scrapbooks that have been sewn through the fold, but even more frequently, you'll see scrapbooks with a side stitched or post bound structure. You can see an example of post binding in the top right image, where metal posts have been inserted between two cover boards to hold the pages in place. There are also spiral bindings like the one in the lower right corner and a plethora of homespun structures. Over time, the materials used in the binding can break down. The covers or boards on the outside of a scrapbook can become detached or broken, or they, there may be too much pressure on the fasteners. In the postbound case, you can see that a piece of the cover actually snapped off the metal post, which is likely due to stress from opening and closing the book repeatedly. Side sewn or post bound bindings are the most problematic because of how the binding restricts the opening of the pages. Um, all albums, all the album materials, be it paper, cloth, leather, or plastic, have their advantages and disadvantages. So you just have to weigh those with your needs. So a storage and handling are important considerations, and we will address that in a later section. The pages of the binding are the supports for all the ephemera and scraps to get glued to, which is why we call them support pages. Commercially available scrapbooks can be made with poor quality materials. The acidic, brittle, and discolored paper here is a great example of that. The paper is very fragile and prone to tears or breakage. Extra care should be taken when handling paper like this, especially if the scrapbook is side sewn or post bound. Brittle paper is also more prone to damage if whatever is attached to the paper is heavy or stiff. And by heavy, I mean heavier than the support pager, pages. We will look at recommended paper characteristics momentarily. Fasteners may be used to attach loose items to the page. These include staples, photo corners, paper clips, brads, pins, ribbon, thread, and much more. It is important to choose a type of fastener to be used carefully, as some can be more damaging than others. Fasteners like staples or paper clips may become brittle and stain your documents and are probably not the best choice. This is an area where it's surprisingly easy to cause damage. Even so-called archival plastic paper clips are still going to press into your documents and photographs and cause damage over time. So you really don't want them either. Instead, you can group those associated items together by placing them between a sheet of folded paper. If you must use a fastener, it would be good to stick with um, polyester photo mounting corners. Polyester is a non-reactive plastic, which behaves well over the long term. Tape is another common method of attaching items to scrapbooks. We've seen ephemera attached with scotch tape, magic mending tape, masking tape, electrical and packing tape, even duct tape. None of these are good options. All tapes are made out of some type of carrier, either plastic paper or cloth, that's lined in a gummy adhesive. Both the adhesive and the carrier can have aging problems. Essentially, they discolor and they dry up over time, leading to failure of the adhesive. The adhesive can also stain the paper or photo it's attached to, and it can sink into the paper, causing it to become hard and brittle. Tape can be very difficult to remove without causing damage, and it's not always possible to remove the stains that tape leaves behind. 
there is no such thing as archival tape. There is no type of pressure sensitive tape that I think is acceptable for use on items of value. I know there are tapes out there that market themselves as archival. And while they have, may have passed the PAT testing, we really don't know how they will age. More importantly, tape is not readily reversible. And in conservation, we advocate for using reversible methods only. Um, I see I have a question from Laura. Is washi tape safe? Um, I'd have to look into that a little bit more. I, I, I've heard of washi tape, but I haven't used it personally. But as long as it has that gummy adhesive, that's very difficult to remove. Um, so it's better to hold off on tape in general. We don't like to use tape as much. It's easy. Um, well, it's, it's good that it's easy to remove. Um, I'd have to look into it and uh, see if um, there's residue. The problem isn't just whether you can remove the tape, it's whether it leaves something behind. And uh, reversible is always good. So um, I can look into some sources and then maybe pop that into the resource guide if that helps. Or if anybody has um, any feedback there to share, please feel free to put it into the chat. Tape runner that goes on the back of an item. Hmm. Could you describe that a little bit more, Wendy? I'm not sure what you mean by the tape runner. Is it like the item automatically has an adhesive that's um, associated with it? Is that what you're trying to say, Wendy? Hmm. Again, I'd have to look into that a little bit more. I haven't I haven't come across tape runner. Um, if you can avoid using any adhesive, it would be ideal. If you can't, you might consider like mitigation, like maybe trying to cover the adhesive onto, so that it doesn't get onto other things, like maybe um, get another a backer or some sort of um, acid-free paper that can help. Because the problem is if the adhesive breaks down and releases acid, acid it, um, it could affect everything else. So you want to, if there's no way to avoid using the tape, then you want to just isolate it from everything else inside your scrapbook. Um, does that help? I can also look into that a little bit more. Um, any more questions? You're welcome. All right. So I'm going to go on to the next slide if People are okay for the moment. All right. So we're going to talk about adhesive just a little bit longer. Um, transparent tape, aka scotch tape, wasn't invented until 1930. So before that time, other adhesives were used. Glue or paste is wet and messy and needs to dry. Some commercial scrapbooks were sold with uh, gummed adhesive applied to the page. The ideal scrapbook is shown on the left, and that is a brand name, not a personal endorsement. This scrapbook used gum adhesive dots that were applied in a uniform manner all over the page and was around from about 1901 onwards. The Mark Twain scrapbook used lines of gummed adhesive called mucilage. Both adhesives were similar to a postage stamp or an envelope. A small amount of moisture would reactivate the adhesive so that items could be attached. Using scrapbooks like this is an obvious preservation concern because that adhesive can be reactivated with moisture. So care needs to be taken to prevent, prevent, protect from water damage as well as high humidity, lest the pages become stuck together. Interleaving may be a good idea should this be an issue. And of course, the most common way to add item, items to a page is by gluing it. This is another thing that makes scrapbook preservation so difficult, the variety of adhesives that are used. Depending on the age of your scrapbook, you may even have animal glues, starch-based adhesives, polymer-based adhesives, even rubber, rubber cement. One of the biggest preservation issues with adhesives is that over time, the glue can start to move or to seep through the scraps or support pages, causing, causing things to stick together. 
Another big problem is the discoloration, which you can see clearly here. This staining shows how clumsily the glue was applied. Unfortunately, this staining cannot always be removed. Now, given the choice, I know people were talking, asking questions about adhesives. The safest adhesive to use would be cold water wheat starch paste due to its stability and reversibility. We're going to talk a little bit about the term archival now. Unlike familiar food marketing items like organic or cage free, there is no regulated standard that materials must meet to be advertised as archival. And yet, in these five little screen grabs from vendors' web websites, the word archival appears a total of 19 times. So it must mean something, right? Vendors, and even I, use the term archival as a shorthand way to suggest that products are stable and suited for long-term use. So while the term archival alone is not enough for you to be sure about the quality of a product, it can lead you to sources that will have appropriate materials. From there, you need to keep digging for more information. You see on screen some of the most common sources for archival products, including Gaylord Archival, University Products, and Talus. Um, I've included links to their websites for your resource in your resource guide in case you'd like to explore that a little bit more. For paper-based materials, more information should include whether the product is acid and lignin-free if it is buffered or unbuffered, if it's passed the PAT test and other such things. We'll get to what all of these items mean in a minute, but first let's look at where to find the information. As an example, we have a product that most vendors of archival products will carry, Permalife 20 pound bond paper. On these five product pages, you'll notice some things right away. You can see that the packaging varies and the exact name of the product varies, and also what the vendors emphasize about the products vary. So be sure you know what you are getting. So to be sure that you know what you're getting, you need to keep digging. In some cases, that means reading the fine print right there at the top of the product page. It's not the easiest or most obvious format, but there is a ton of useful information in these paragraphs, including not only info about the weight and color of the paper, but about the presence or absence of acid and lignin, pH and buffering, fiber content, and expected longevity. This is the information you need to make informed choices. In other cases, there's a little bit of information at the top of the page, but to get the full picture, you need to scroll down to the bottom of the page. Again, once you get there, there's a lot of information available. And some web pages require you to click open a different tab than the one that appears when you first land on the page. The tab might be labeled as specs, details about the product, more info, or any variation on that theme. So try them all until you find the information. And now that you've found the information about the product, how do you interpret it? Let's go through some of the commonly used terms from these descriptions. You see, all of the descriptions say the paper is acid free. And we all have a pretty good idea that this is important, but what does it actually mean? The term acid free can be used to market any paper that is pH neutral or slightly alkaline at the time of manufacture. But it does not guarantee that a paper will remain in the neutral pH range as it ages, which leads to the question of what would cause the pH to change over time. The answer is lignin. In addition to acid free, all the descriptions say that our, sa our sample paper is lignin free. Most of the trees used in paper manufacture are conifers and the pulp from conifers is made up of cellulose and up to 30% lignin. 
Lignin is the bonding agent that holds the cellular structure together and allows the tree to be strong enough to stand up. It is also the component in wood pulp that produces acid as it breaks down and causes paper to discolor and become brittle. Chemical processing of the wood pulp can remove almost all of the lignin, producing purified alpha cellulose, from which high quality archival papers can be produced. Our example is described as buffered with a 3% alkaline reserve. This means that an alkaline agent has been added during manufacture, in this case, calcium carbonate. Buffering has the effect of creating a slightly alkaline paper. Paper produced with an alkaline reserve will have some ability to continue to neutralize acids as they develop in the paper, infiltrate from the environment, or migrate from contact with more acidic materials. Most materials will benefit from being stored in buffered materials. However, there are a few critical exceptions. Some color photographs and animal protein-based materials such as silk and wool should be stored in unbuffered storage materials. Silk and wool are naturally slightly acidic and will deteriorate, deteriorate less quickly if kept in a compatible environment. And next, another common piece of information in product descriptions, fiber content. Our example is described as containing 75% pure cellulose and 25% cotton. Wood pulp can be processed in two ways, either by grinding up the tree mechanically, which leaves the lignin in the pulp, or by breaking it down chemically to extract the cellulose, leaving the lignin out. Mechanical processing produces paper using the entire tree and is consequently less expensive, but the paper produced this way is not appropriate for archival storage because the lignin makes it acidic and unstable over time. It is worth mentioning that some groundwood pa papers can be sold as acid-free if they are buffered, but they will still discolor and break down eventually. Chemical processing produces less paper from the same number of trees, and it's consequently more expensive. But paper produced this way, both buffered and unbuffered, will remain stable over time. So what about the other 25% of the fiber in our example? Up until about the middle of the 19th century, paper was largely made from cotton and linen rags. This produced paper that was naturally pH neutral, lignin free and stronger and more flexible than wood paper pulp. At the bottom of the screen is an image of the Nuremberg Chronicle printed in 1493. More than 500 years later, the paper is still finer than most of what is available today. Wood pulp paper was introduced to meet the increased demand for paper that came with the Industrial Revolution as the rag supply was insufficient. Today, cotton is still used in paper to increase strength and fold endurance. Some of the cotton still comes from rags, which produce the longest fibers, and some comes from cotton linters, which are made from reprocessing cotton seeds after the longest fibers have been removed for textile manufacture. Product descriptions frequently make claims about the longevity of the paper. Some use vague terms like favorite of conservators or for use in museums and archives, but others make very specific claims about how long the paper will last. In this case, there is a regulatory standard behind the items, permanent or durable, when used to describe the expected durability of paper. To meet this standard, paper must be expected to be stable for roughly 300 years in, optical, in optimal storage conditions. You'll see in the slide that the bond weights of these papers are watermarked so that you will always be able to distinguish them from other bond weight papers.
Another standard-based piece of information that is sometimes provided is whether the material has passed the photographic activity test. The photographic activity test, or PAT, is a worldwide standard, ISO standard 18916, for archival, archival quality in photographic enclosures. Developed by IPI, the Image Permanence Institute, this test predicts possible interactions between photographic images and the enclosures in which they are stored. The PAT tests for chemical interactions when the material is in contact with photographs. This is an important piece of information to know about materials that will be used to store all types of photographs. The PAT does not specifically relate to buffering and there are unbuffered PAT tested papers available. Some websites will put this info right up front and others will make you read the fine print to find it. If you can't find it, it means one of these three things. Either the product has not been tested, it has been tested but did not pass, or the vendor just didn't think it was important to their customers. All right. So now we know that we want acid-free, lignin-free materials. We know that in all but a few cases, we want buffered materials. We know that we should have PAT approved materials for use with photos. But at, what else should we consider when choosing materials? Thickness is perhaps the most important consideration because adding too much interleaving to an intact binding can stress the binding. Your interleaving options are typically text weight paper, bond weight paper, or tissue. Bond weight papers like Permalife and Permadur are easy to handle, don't crumple easily, but they add more thickness. Microchamber interleaving paper is slightly floppier than the previous two, but has greater ability to protect against acid migration and is more expensive. Interleaving tissue is more difficult to handle and crumples easily, but adds far less thickness if extensive interleaving is required. If a bound volume is frequently used and needs only limited interleaving, bond weight is ideal. If it is seldom used and needs extensive interleaving, tissue is fine. For photo albums or other collections that include photos, be sure to use interleaving that has passed the PAT. Heritage Archival Photograph, a photocraft, is a good option that comes in both buffered and unbuffered versions and has a very smooth finish. Do not use glassine. It is not approved for long-term storage. Do cut your interleaving paper slightly smaller than the size of the page. It should be contained within the volume. It's best to interleave the entire page rather than cutting a small piece to cover a specific clipping on the page. This might save you paper, but the interleaving is much more likely to move, fall out of the scrapbook, or catch on to other scraps if it is cut to fit a specific scrap. And if you'd like to source things, you'll find links to the sources for these materials in your resource guide. Since interleaving is used as a preservation strategy, let's go into some more detail about when to interleave. So times to add interleaving include when scraps on facing pages are causing damage, for example, acidic newspaper clippings, um, between pages with poorly aging fasteners or adhesives, such as rusty staples, old tape, and adhesive stains. If pages contain inks or pigments that are offsetting or rubbing off, between pages with gummed adhesive or self-adhesives that'll keep things from sticking together. And when pages contain photographs, botanical specimens, or 3D attachments. Now this is an example of what not to do. While this person had the right idea in adding interleaving, they didn't go about adding it in a way that protects the book. If you can see, the paper isn't tall enough to protect the pages from one another. 
It's also far too long on the fore edge. Thus, when turning the interleaving paper, which is too short, a user could tear the support page. This makes it harder to handle. And because the interleaving paper isn't close to the page size, it could catch on attach items and cause damage. Also, this is a mess and hard to store. Overfilling the pages of a, scrap of a scrapbook can place further stress on the board joints as well as, as well as the pages. This picture is a prime example of a binding that is at its limit. It may not be possible to interleave every page. Maybe every other is the best you can do. In uh, less extreme cases, it could be helpful to use spacers between the leaves of a scrapbook album to allow more room for the thickness of objects in the scrapbook, um, as, well as, as well as other interleaving and pages like that, and to reduce strain on the binding. If you like to use paper book flags or store printed documentation, be sure to use the same standards for those materials as you would for these storage materials themselves. Remember that temporary solutions have a way of becoming permanent. So if you have good quality materials on hand, even temporary solutions can be safe for your collections in the long term. Plastic sleeves are also a popular format used in scrapbooks. However, the type of sleeve used also plays a part in longevity. The best materials to use for page protectors and photo sleeves are polyethylene and polypropylene. They are generally um, inert and non-reactive plastics. Polyester is also a viable option. Plastics vary in clarity, thickness, and rigidity. So which plastic to use really depends on the item that is to be stored in it. Here's a nice little graphic from Gaylord that can be a handy uh, reference. Remember though, to avoid using PVC or acetates, acetate plastics as they do degrade and will cause long-term issues. So let's recap what we have gone over in this section concerning selecting materials. Archival is good, but you need to know more. Read the fine print. Keep digging if necessary. Know your paper. Look for acid-free, lignin-free, buffered or unbuffered, depending on your needs, um, PAT tested, and the fiber content. Know your plastic. Look for polyester, polypropylene, or polyethylene, and avoid PVC and acetate. Consider the weight and other properties of paper and plastic storage materials. And choose solutions based on condition, size, and usage of materials. And finally, have good materials on hand to avoid bad choices. All right, I know that that was a chunk of information. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat. Um, and while, you know, I'll give you a moment to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and take a sip of water. Ah, so I see a question. Um, can you explain glycine, please? What is it? So glycine is this really um, glossy, thin, kind of crispy paper that is commonly used in, I think, library settings. You find it a lot. Um, but so, so it's very popular to use or has been in the past and it was thought to be good. But the problem is it isn't archival. It's not... Um, guaranteed to not decay and is, um, is the, could be acidic. So we do recommend not using glycine because there are better options that have been tested and are um, approved archivally for long-term. Does that, does that help? 
Sure, you're welcome. I see another question. Um, if there are straight pins used as fasteners, should they be removed as a general rule of thumb? If you can remove them safely, I would probably remove the straight pins because they can rust and they can cause pressure damage. Um, you'd have to assess, it's a case-to-case -case basis. If, if it will damage, then maybe you wanna consult a conservator because they might have techniques that can help remove things that are risky. If there's, if there's any, any concern at all, if something is fragile, I, I would consult with a, a specialist. But um, if you can remove it safely, um, I, would, I would recommend removing straight pins. Let's see, Wendy asks, is it better to take apart or redo a scrapbook that is falling apart or simply preserve it? Again, that's a case-to-case -case basis. In some, in some cases, it is good to take these things apart and store them in a box maybe because it can reduce pressure and, um, and prevent further damage. Um, in other cases, it could be good just to put it in a box as is. You, you look at the, the look at the um, how the stability of the item. If it's crumbling, a, you probably don't want to touch it, and you probably just want to box it. If you if it's really important that it be taken apart, maybe to digitize, then you want to consult with somebody with a with a conservator so that because there are ways to safely uh, take things apart. Ah, let's see. That's, I hope that answers your question, Wendy. Okay, let's see. Sue Ellen has a question about banana tapes. How about those banana tapes used to make 3D effects on scrapping books? Are they safe? What can be used in place of them? I have not encountered banana tapes either. Um, I would say anything that is a tape and a pressure adhesive is risky. Um, for 3D effects and stuff, like um, we said, like I said earlier, there's a lot of stuff available on the market. It's not necessarily been tested for archival quality and a lot of things that are plastics can degrade. You don't know what kind of plastic it is. Before you use any type of material, I would recommend going through this process that we just went over where you really do a deep dive into its specs. Look at its specs um, before you use anything. And uh, usually, hopefully they can be found on the vendor site or you could see on the internet if there's anything about those particular items. If you have any doubts at all, best to avoid it. Um, if you need an adhesive, as I mentioned, you could try the polyester photo corners because they are a stable plastic and won't, won't degrade over time. And um, wheat starch paste if you need a glue. Those are, those are probably the safest option. But if you wanna use something else, always do your research. Okay, um, let's see. You're welcome. And uh, I have a question from Julia. Could you please discuss digital scrapbooking versus hard copy scrapbooks? Pros and cons, especially if photographs are involved. Uh, Julia, that is a big topic because um, digital scrapbooking and digital objects have their own concerns that that could be another hour of conversation i could point you to some resources um, we do have some resources on digitizing and digital materials at nedcc that i could drop into your resource guide if that will help and um yeah they there there are a lot of digital things can decay as well as we all know because the, the, as technology passes, they, they don't last forever. So um, let me think on that and we'll get back to you. Okay, and uh, one more question from Lindsay. Also interested in knowing best practices when dealing with scrapbooks that are falling apart or are falling out of pages or out of their laced or post binding. Also curious about news clippings that have deteriorated so much from acid that they are hardly visible anymore. 
So best practices when dealing with scrapbooks that are falling apart. Again, if they're really, really fragile, I would suggest contacting a conservator. AIC has a great tool on their website, and I believe there's a link on your resource guide to them where you can find conservators to practice in your area because um, they know all the details and they can save things or they, they know what to do and what they can save. Um, if it's really, really falling apart, if, um, if you're not a conservator, I would suggest putting it in an archival box so that it doesn't, uh, um, it doesn't take much more damage because um, somebody who doesn't know what they're doing can accidentally cause more damage. So I, yeah, at the very least, when dealing with something that is falling out and falling apart, I would just get uh, safe housing for it. Um, news clippings, unfortunately, are, they have inherent vice and they will they create degrade on their own because they are naturally acidic and there's not much you can do. There is a spray commercially available, but we don't really um, recommend using that on a lot, like a big chunk, maybe for little things, and it is quite expensive. From for news clippings, there there isn't much choice if they're hardly visible too, because you can't bring it back from that point. So if you really need the material, I would suggest looking around for other sources that because if it's something that's common, there might be somebody else who has made a digitized copy of it or who has a copy of it. And then you can discuss sharing and maybe obtaining a facsimile or, facsimile or something from that. But uh, there's there's really no bringing back news clippings from the brink. You just have to mitigate, maybe line them with some uh, acid-free paper to help absorb some of the acid out and slow things down. Um, hopefully that addressed some of your questions. And thank you for sharing um, uh, information about glassine. Translucent pastry bags, that is a good, yeah, that's a good description. All right. Does anybody else have any questions or should we continue on with the material? Still one more section to go. All right. So hopefully this section will answer more of your questions. We're going to go over some general guidelines for how to handle scrapbooks, how to support the spine and that sort of thing. These are rules that you can pass along to your family members and other volunteers you may know. It's all about being sensitive to possible risks. Let's start with the big one. Do you need to wear gloves? Yes and no. There's been a lot of debate on this topic in the, in the field. For, for most paper-based materials, gloves are not necessary. Yes, finger oils can damage paper, but wearing gloves makes it hard to feel and you are more likely to tear pages, especially brittle paper. Instead, we recommend that you use nitrile gloves. These are single-use items, so they don't get reused. One and done. But if you are concerned about the environmental impact, there are glove recycling programs out there, and I encourage you to look into it. We recycle gloves at NEDCC. Uh, I have included some information about this in the resource guide as well. So before we get to handling, we need to be prepared. This is going to seem pretty formal, but I think you have the right to take your historic records and books seriously. Treat them according to museum and library practice. So start with yourself. You want to have clean, dry hands. Don't use any creams or hand sanitizers. Just wash and dry them thoroughly. Don't wear nail polish as it can mark your book. Tuck in any baggy shirts or ties or scarves and pull back your hair. Basically, when I'm going to handle archival material, I just pretend that I'm going to operate some heavy machinery. And once you're prepared, get your workspace set up. Now, it doesn't matter if you're just grabbing a book quickly. You need to have a large flat space available that's clean and empty. Some items may be very large and heavy, so before you pick anything up, know where you're going to put it down. Clear the path between your storage and your workspace and open any doors or move anything that's going to be in your way. The last thing you need while carrying a heavy book is to trip over a cord or a chair leg or anything like that.
And as I mentioned before, items that are heavier than the support page can cause damage, especially when turning the page. So it is important to turn the pages carefully, especially if you have something heavy attached to the page. You may not know what to expect when turning the page of a scrapbook. First, gently lift the page to test its weight. Does it feel like there's something heavy on the other side? Is it catching on anything on the following page? Photo corners in particular can catch on each other and pages can stick together for any number of reasons. If you need to take a peek under the page to see what's going on, do so. Then gently slide your palm under the page. This gives you a chance to feel what is on the page and to make sure that you are supporting the right areas. If you feel photographs, that's okay. Just gently move your palm. Use two hands to make a sandwich. Your hands are the bun and the page is the burger. And remember that what is the top side of the leaf will become the bottom side as you turn the page over. If necessary, use your other hand to support any heavy or floppy objects as you turn the leaf over. Know that you may need to adjust the way the volume is supported as you move through it. Volumes often open very differently in the center than they do at the beginning or at the end. If you have a book with a restricted opening or a weak cover attachment, you can use book cradles to provide support. If you have foam book supports, I highly recommend using them. If you don't have any, I recommend buying some. I have a link for a nice one in the resource guide. These are great because you can stack them as needed to get the support you need. Snake weights, which are fabric covered lead weights, are great for holding pages open. And there are other kinds of supports out there, but these are my favorite. And now for your storage environment. With regards to temperature, in general, our scrapbooks are most comfortable in the same environment that we are comfortable in. So around 68 to 70 degrees with a 30 to 50% relative humidity. The temperature is almost always better lower. So if you have dedicated storage, dropping the temperature down to about 55 degrees would be great. Now, light damage is cumulative and irreversible. Always keep items out of direct sunlight. Use UV filtering shades or film if needed. And you could replace incandescent and fluorescent bulbs with LEDs. LEDs do not produce UV. They produce less heat and are more energy efficient. There are a lot of options when it comes to storage enclosures. Pre-made boxes are available in a variety of styles and sizes and can be modified to fit individual items with spacers. You can also order custom boxes from a variety of vendors in a variety of styles. The type of box you choose may depend on your budget, your timeline, and what vendors you have a relationship with. Cloth clamshell boxes are more expensive and take longer to make. Custom boxes need to be measured and ordered, which you might not have time for. Pre-made boxes are fast and relatively cheap and can have a variety of uses. You can see the resource guide again for more information about uh, vendors. All right, we are almost done for the day. Here is a quick wrap up of the points that we've discussed today. Scrapbooks are unique items that need special care because they contain a wide variety of materials. Over time, bindings, pages, scraps, and adhesives break down, but choosing the right materials can slow down and in some cases halt the process. Controlling the environment and handling of scrapbooks will help slow their deterioration. And some protective steps that you can take for your scrapbooks include boxing them and thoughtful interleaving. If you're looking for more resources, uh, more resources or further reading, you can find lots of useful info on our website, nedcc.org, as well as in the resource guide that you will have access to in the publicly shared folder. 
And that is the end of today's webinar. I would be happy to answer your questions in the four minutes that we have remaining. And uh, please feel free to type any of your questions into the chat box. And while you're doing that, I'd like to encourage all of you to take just a few minutes to answer our webinar evaluation form. The link is on the screen here, and it will be in the follow-up email message that Kim O'Leary sends you. Your feedback really does help us when the NEDCC applies for funding to subsidize the cost of these training webinars. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm, I hope you got um, a lot of information and things that are helpful to you. And I'm, I'm glad that so many of you could join me today. This has been a, a, fun, to a fun topic to talk about. Let's see. Oh, I have a question. Let's see. Would you recommend to undo the binding if it represents a threat to the pages? Uh, so yes, we, we talked about that a little bit earlier. If, um, if you can do it safely, it really depends on the object. If it's stable, you could consider it. Um, but you want to make sure that whatever you do doesn't cause further damage. If you are in any doubt, don't don't touch it. I mean, inaction is better if you have doubt that it might cause more damage and just find a safe housing for it. Get get a nice box. And if you um, think that it needs work, then I would really recommend contacting a conservator. And we, we do have um, some resources on our website, NEDCC.org, to talk about working with a conservator. And um, also, you can find a conservator in your area using the Find a Professional tool through AIC. And hopefully that clarifies a little bit more. Let's see, I have a question, question here. Would you use book glue on a scrapbook like Gaylord PH neutral glue? As you can see in our example earlier, they did, set, they did state that the, they were selling the PH neutral glue. Um, I guess it would depend on your on you, like if you are making a scrapbook, your choices, if, if you have like really look into that glue, I know that uh, there are glues that are commonly used like school glues and things. Just remember that they're irreversible. If you can at all use like wheat paste, if it's the reversibility that we're here. Um, if it's their personal item, it's really your choice. I would recommend, yes, using a neutral glue if you had to use a glue. Um, if you can use wheat start paste, wheat starch paste at all, that would be preferable because then you can safely remove it at a later point if you wanted to. But again, look at look at the specs. That's why we went through that section. Just really dig into the material, make sure that it is something that is safe for you. Ah, I hope that answers your question. And uh, I have seen another question. Um, what would we use to preserve pages with wool or silk elements? So please use unbuffered because um, store them in something unbuffered because the buffering does have an effect on them. So get you, you can purchase um, papers or boxes that are unbuffered that are archival quality. And um, yeah, probably put some, put some of that as interleaving if it's already in a book or if you can wrap it separately if it's not attached. Um, definitely keep it out of light. Yeah, and uh, box, box the whole thing in, in something safe, archival, acid-free, and all of that, and uh, keep it in the dark. And uh, again, wool and silk would be unbuffered. And then uh, wheat starch paste, you can actually buy that. Uh, if you go to the archival suppliers, you can buy it in a, in a um, powdered form, and then you can make it as you need because it does, it does degrade. So you wanna make it in small batches as you need to use it. But if you look at one of those sites, you should be able to find wheat starch, wheat paste glue powder. I think it involves a little bit of cooking in the microwave. So it can be a fun chemistry experiment. And you are very welcome. Are there any other questions? We are at time, but uh, do I know if PVA glue degrades? Mm. I don't personally know, but there are sites out there. Like if you go to AIC, they have a materials working group. So you might be able to see on their materials working group, whether they've done studies, there's something called an Audi test that, uh, that looks into long-term 
um, lifespans of products. So yeah, check out the AIC website and, and try to find the materials working group wiki if you want to check about the PVA glue and other and other things that might have been tested. And um, difference between vinyl and nitrile gloves. Well, they're two different chemicals, so um, they're they're made out of different components. The difference uh, we can you could use vinyl and uh, versus nitrile gloves if you want to. The reason we usually avoid vinyl gloves is some people are. Um, oh wait, I'm talking about latex. Sorry, I'm thinking about latex and allergies. Vinyl is less stable, so I would use a nitrile glove. Yeah, vinyl is more likely to degrade. And so it off gases and could produce harmful things. So yes, definitely nitrile gloves over vinyl gloves. I hope that answers your question. Sorry about the confusion. Let's see. Did I miss anybody's questions? They came pretty fast and furious at the end. All right, yeah, we are at time. Thank you for sticking out with me. Um, so again, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at info at NADCC.org. And um, I will try to get some, see, see if I can add anything to the resource guide based on the questions that you have asked. And um, yeah, I will let you go for today. Thank you again for spending this hour with me. And um, I will stop the recording.